the uh, this is the uh, first afternoon session of the Epstein Symposium. The first talk was to be given by Dr. Van Buell, but he had an emergency and couldn't make it. So the talk is going to be given by a co-worker, uh, David Unger. And David was a an undergraduate at Rutgers. He has an MS from, from Maryland, University of Maryland. He joined the NWS in 1979, actually as a member of the Techniques Development Laboratory. He worked on statistical methods and post-processing. And then he moved on to the Climate Prediction Center in 1994 and is now focusing on post-processing ensemble systems. So uh, Dave's uh, the, the talk is on the estimation of climatology using harmonics. Dave. Okay. Uh, who Van der Duel sends his uh, apologies uh, for not being able to make it. This is uh, his examination of the uh, uh, problem of uh, climatologies. And uh, in some way, uh, Ed Epstein came to, to uh, CPC, well then CAC, sometime in late 1983 or early 84. Um, and one of the assignments that he uh, had to take on uh, was to uh, to look at the climate uh, driving climatologies and one thing wrong with climatologies is at first glance they seem perhaps a little bit too easy uh, adding 30 numbers and dividing by 30 doesn't seem that uh, difficult but you have noise and uh, we have a lot of climatologies to drive we need daily average and, and uh, daily varying five-day means, et cetera. And uh, so he worked with Tony Barnston on the problem. And uh, if you look here, the, you'll see that the um, uh, in red is that simple climatology, add 30 numbers, divide by 30. This is a, from the uh, uh, reanalysis, um, uh, a grid point someplace in North Dakota. And uh, we take... 30, uh, take daily values of the uh, two meter temperature and take the daily averages for January for 365 days, forgetting about the leap year for the time being from uh, January 1st to December 31st. And in red, you see the uh, uh, um, result of that. And you see a lot of noise, and you would think because of the annual cycle is, is fairly simple, you could fit that with one harmonic, and that is indeed what this, uh, the blue line here is, to fit through the day, uh, the, the average of the 30-year averages uh, on the uh, one harmonic fit. And you see it does, it does capture the lion's share of the uh, 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 um, variance. Um, but you see a lot of uh, uh, you see a lot of systematic uh, differences that you are wondering whether or not that's real or, or not. If you look closely, this is a, 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 the 30-year averages, and you could obviously see that this is noise. But some of those other um, um, one harmonic, uh, some of these systematic things you uh, sus would highly suspect is something real. So it's, it's not a problem to fit more harmonics. And there is a four harmonic wave fit through the same data. And here, it looks pretty good. Now, Ed, of course, um, being a statistician, did not uh, uh, settle for just eyeballing the results. And he indeed uh, uh, looked at this problem by testing the um, uh, many measures of goodness of fit, and he came to the conclusion that uh, the annual cycle could be f well fit uh, with three or four harmonics. Um, they, uh, uh, in most uh, well-behaved areas, uh, that would do it. Um, Uh, and he he did come uh, um, publish several publications on this uh, um, particular 
problem here, again, mostly focusing on objective, uh, objective techniques of tel uh, um, um, selecting the number of harmonics. And recently, these have uh, the, the conclusions have uh, uh, been looked at and have st stood up. Uh, um, uh, um, Narpa Seti, Tippett, the Soul, and uh, uh, um, have looked at this problem recently, treating climatology in a, uh, as a forecast in a cross-validation mode, one year out, uh, uh, um, taking one year out fitting the harmonics, using the, uh, treating it as a forecast, minimizing RMS error. And indeed, they also have concluded that three to four harmonics are about optimum. Um, now, uh, of course, the, the, uh, uh, this method is being applied almost industrially in the uh, uh, um, Climate Prediction Center because we have a lot of climatologies. We have reanalysis. We have uh, high-resolution high data sets that all need climatology. And of course, uh, recently, um, uh, uh, climate model predict prediction requires a, a, a subtracting out the model climatologies. So each of the model fields has to have a a climatology derived, and this uh, harmonic method is uh, being used uh, routinely without too much uh, need to, uh, to for further examination. Here you see a case from the uh, CFS version one. This is the uh, analysis here of these 500 millibar heights at some point, uh, I guess, close to, to uh, Washington, D.C. or York, Pennsylvania. and. Um, you see here that, again, this we fit the four harmonics. It looks pretty good. There's a lot of noise in the 30-year da daily averages. Of course, this is uh, analysis, but we also have to derive the, four, uh, the, um, the uh, um, harmonics for the um, model forecast fields. And here you see the hindcast data from the CFS uh, version 1. And that hindcast data was archived in groups of, to, in order to save computation times, they have groups of five days each, uh, three, three separate um, uh, groups of five days per month. And so in this case, the harmonic smoother is not only being used to, to smooth out the climatology and to derive an annual uh, uh, daily climatology, but also to fill in the uh, missing uh, values. This is a this is a, and turns out a nine month forecast and it was not adjusted for the uh, uh, target period. So it looks as though it's shifted, but it's really uh, uh, in reference to the, uh, to the initial time. Um, so there's been, uh, we've been, uh, Jay Shem and uh, 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 Hugh Van and Dool uh, uh, and Several others at, uh, at CPC and e e EMC have been using the, these techniques and uh, deriving climatologies for reanalysis, and this is just some um, of the references that have um, um, uh, been recently published. Now, of course, there are some problems with uh, uh, um, harmonic smoothing to, to derive climatologies, and. Uh, who summarized some of these here? Uh, we can perhaps discuss them because I don't think that I will be taking all 30 minutes of the time. Uh, but there's a philosophical problem with the harmonics, and that's because harmonics fit through a, 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 an entire year. And so that what happens is that uh, in fitting through perhaps summertime anomalies or, or, or singularities, you'll get some effects, spurious effects in the wintertime. Um, and this is particularly true if the climatology has some near discontinuities and uh, um, the, the harmonics uh, 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 may have trouble smoothing uh, uh, sharp uh, singularities such as might happen in uh, uh, monsoonal regions and that affects both uh, temperatures and uh, uh, precipitation. 
Um, remember that we're mass pr producing climatologies, so we don't have time to look at each and every one, each and every grid point on the uh, globe. Um, some variables, of course, don't exist all time year round. Uh, try fitting a, a harmonic to daily snowfall amount someplace, and you'll have to have an entire uh, um, warm season of, of exactly zero. That doesn't seem like such a good idea. And uh, of course, uh, snowfall amount is an ex extreme example, but uh, when you're doing a precip fitting precip climatologies over the whole globe, you of course know that there are some, many uh, places in the earth with dry seasons and, and uh, uh, um, many opportunities for this problem to arise. And finally, the anomaly data, uh, the, the, the curve that you uh, uh, derive is not centered. And uh, one of the problems that uh, Hugh mentions is that, again, perhaps climatology is a bit too easy to derive, and we uh, indeed find that many researchers just start from scratch and derive it their own way using um, uh, um, pooling data uh, uh, or using tr filters to, to try to filter the data. So um, not, like I say, this is, this is one method of, of, of uh, uh, deriving a daily climatology, and I, I think it's a, perhaps one of the best ones when you have a massive amount of, uh, of data go to go through and you want, to, uh, you want to assure a smooth daily uh, cycle throughout the year. Yeah, so I mentioned that about the, the multiple uh, climatologies. And um, now there's one little glaring uh, omission here, and that is that we did, uh, there is a, a small, seemingly small issue, I guess it is a small issue, to dealing with February 29th. Of course, uh, uh, we've fit through 365 days, but there are 366 days once every three years, um, except uh, uh, on the century marks, in which case it's, uh, you skip one, unless the year is divided by 400 and so on. So um, uh, there's a lot of kind of non-physical calendar um, um, issues creeping into our climatology. So. Considering that uh, Ed started out as an astronomy major, um, perhaps we should uh, look, bring a little astronomy into this problem and see what happens. So here is the real uh, year. As um, what you'll see is that you have a, a, a uh, what's known as a tropical year, and if you define your year as uh, the um, amount of time that it takes to Earth to get back to the same place with reference to a fixed star, you get uh, oh, you get a tropical year, which is listed here as uh, 365, and not, it's not exactly 0.25, but it's uh, some odd fraction of a day. But actually, the climate doesn't really operate on that cycle. The climate pays more attention to this factor called the uh, anomalistic year, probably mispronounced. Um, but that is defined, if you notice that the Earth is on an elliptical orbit, and if you, uh, at, at, on January 3rd nowadays, uh, the closest approach that the Earth makes to the sun is, uh, occurs on January 3rd, and if you fix that year according to that, which of course is the climate, what the climate knows, it, it sees the uh, um, it, it sees the uh, it not only sees the declination, it, which is but it also sees the distance from the sun. Um, that is a slightly different uh, value. If you divide those two, you get the 20,000 year cycle that it takes the Earth. Right now, uh, where the northern hemisphere winter is when the Earth is closest to the sun, we get a little bit more uh, solar radiation that way. If you wait 10,000 years, it'll be the other way around, and the northern hemisphere winter will be the furthest away. Anyway, so you can, you can the astronomers, of which Ed was one early on, can give us an equation that 
will um, specify what the, Earth, what the Earth's climate does care about, and that is the amount of heat that it gets from the sun. And you will see here that you have this one term, which is related to the distance that the Earth is from the sun. That's one uh, uh, that has a, uh, a, a, a uh, varies by the time of year. And you have the another term in the blue, which says which shows the um, the declination. So the the distance of the sun is the same for the whole Earth. The declination, of course, varies by your latitude, and um, and it also has some day length uh, factors into there. And so the, this equation is actually what is really going on. Our our, our real uh, um, spectral uh, or, or harmonic. Um, and so the issue is okay so the issue is well why not just do it the right way instead of averaging 30 days by that artificial calendar that jiggles around a little bit and adds some noise you can fit through all th uh, 30 years of your sample without um, stratifying by day and you can specify uh, periods that are physical according to the um, uh, actual astronomical uh, cycles of the Earth. And so if you do this, here is what you get um, for our same point in North uh, Dakota. Um, a point chosen because of the large amplitude of uh, variability. And you can see here, um, uh, you, now that the, the period is not a, a integral, uh, an integer uh, a fraction of a year, um, you can no longer use traditional um, um, uh, um, spectral uh, harmonic methods, but you have to replace that with an iterative um, uh, solution that uh, um, I think minimizes the squared error. You'll have to ask Hoog for the, the exact details. But um, uh, what, what happens is you have an approach, you're specifying the periods, and you're specifying that the, uh, um, I should have mentioned that the, uh, um, the two terms in there, the declination term and the distance from the uh, Earth are multipli multiplicable. And so you can actually uh, um, find a solution with the, well, actually, we're going to go through the waves, uh, through the uh, data, and see if the uh, uh, um, iterative solution can pick out these waves, pick out the uh, uh, um, um, various components. And here you see the, uh, the results from, for North uh, Dakota here. And the, um, So the, the uh, okay the the the, uh, the red line here is the uh, um, annual cycle, and then you have the distance. The, the factor from the distance of the sun is coming in as another uh, spectral wave in here. It's much smaller, of course, than the uh, effect of the declination of the sun that's changing throughout the year. Um, the green curve is a product. And that is uh, uh, a representation of the um, uh, intensity of the uh, um, incoming solar radiation. And you, uh, uh, you put them all together and you get a, a, a seasonal cycle that applies to each year, but not to each year equally. It, re it accounts for, of course, the what's really going on and uh, there's no need for worrying about what happens on uh, the 29th of, of February or on various years um, um, uh, before or after a, a leap year. Okay, so in the conclusion, um, at it, it, it first glance it seems like a relatively mundane problem of fitting harmonics uh, to a, a uh, climatological mean, but there is some issues on um, or the, the 
uh, annual mean, but there's some issues of noise from day to day. And, uh, and uh, he, we use this harmonics without the astronomy part routinely to um, uh, uh, um, smooth the, um, this, to smooth the uh, uh, climatologies. And uh, the truncated truncation has been looked at and um, uh, uh, chosen such that it's, uh, on the average, minimizes your uh, residual errors. And uh, we then extended this a little bit to, uh, to include some of the more physically um, realistic things that the climate really pays attention to. And at least in some parts of the globe where there's a lot of annual uh, variability, uh, the spectral uh, m method, the uh, nonlinear fitting of this, uh, this, um, the, the spectrum is uh, has applied. I should add that you can add more uh, harmonics by simply taking. In, in, uh, um, you can add, for example, the second harmonic by dividing your instead of 365 days, it's you divide by that uh, fractional. Um, um, the harmonics are based on the fractional uh, amount. So, um, with that, I guess, um, yeah, so we, uh, perhaps we should think about making our fit directly to our data and not going through that intermediate step of the calculating uh, the 365-day means. And so here is a... Uh, this was, I think, from the first uh, dynamic uh, um, uh, dynamic extended range forecast uh, meeting at NASA in 1984, and Ed is uh, uh, pictured there. And thank you. Thanks, Dave. Well, we we uh, we didn't use quite up all the time, so if you have questions, why uh, fire away? I'm in all, on one of your slides on the very last the last line. You said something about they're not centered. What did uh, you mean by that? The uh, you mean the climatology yeah. is not. Uh, you can get if it if, if the fit isn't exact, you can get still get extended time, amounts of time in which uh, the the harmonic fit is not at the mean of the uh, variable. It, in other words, it's slightly different. It's it's not a good probabilistic fit. Perhaps. Any other questions for Dave? Oh. Here's one over here. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, from the analysis that you did with the different harmonics, it looks like the differences with various models in the winter and the uh, much larger during the summer. Is that, is that coincidental? Or is there some. Is it um, basal? Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think there was an observation that oh. oh, this one. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. In some ways, it. it uh, um, I think this. I've seen who give this talk, and he, he emphasizes that in fact, the, when you include the um, uh, solar variability and uh, the physical cycles, it does. Um, Sum up to actually quite a quite a bit different than the expected simple harmonic uh, based on calendar year. So um, um, yeah, so it's and it's not constant from year to year. So you you have to perhaps ask uh, who that. And then also talking about that slide seven seven, the largest spaces are actually not at the peak. The very strong gradients are outside of the largest spaces, are not right at the peak. Yeah. And then.
Okay, the next talk is will be given by Bob Livesey. Bob has a PhD from Penn State. He retired in 2008 as Chief of Climate Services in CAC and is now a private consultant. He's one of the world's top experts on climate statistics and in estimating and tracking weather climate normals over North America. He's been awarded three bronze medals and a gold medal from the Department of Commerce as well as two NOAA Administrator Awards for research and leadership. He's a fellow of the AMS and recipient of the AMS Editor's Award. And his talk is on Tracking Climate Change, Ed Epstein's Influence and Mentorship. Uh, hopefully I'll keep my voice all the way through this. I'm at the tail end of three weeks of a sore throat and cold, but uh, I'm sure we'll do okay. Um, this particular subject is simple, but it's important. Not because I think so, but because uh, there's a number of seasonal forecasters and natural gas companies that think so. And also, um, things I'm going to talk about uh, in certain kinds of diagnostic and forecasting work in our business, if you don't take care of it, you're going to unnecessarily compromise the work. So let's see. I want to. Uh, this is the uh, same slide that Dave showed, but uh, blown up so you can get a better look at Ed. Uh, but I also picked this particular slice. I guess I can. Uh, here's Ed, uh, but I wanted to show you his colleagues uh, in the prediction branch. There's Tony Barnston, Ed Olenek, Don Gilman, over here, uh, Hoog, uh, he, and when he described this to me in a note, an email, he said in the Beatle haircut, uh, and that's me front and center. Uh, but there, there's a lot of other very important people in this particular slice. Uh, I hope I don't neglect to uh, point out anybody who's in the audience, but uh, Kiko Miyakoto, who we heard about earlier this morning, uh, for example, uh, Shukla, uh, Jerome Namias, this may have been one of his last meetings on the East Coast, and uh, Eugenia County, amongst others. Uh, but if you look at the full picture, there's a lot of luminaries at that meeting. Okay, so uh, my outline, uh, some introduction and motivation. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about um, two simple challenges um, in doing um, climate um, variability analysis in, in, in the context of warming climate, two simple statistical problems. One is estimating a normal as an expected value rather than as a re retrospective reference. And uh, this one application of that is forecasting next year. There really isn't much of any other basis for forecasting next year. And the other problem is um, statistically tracking the, the non-stationary normal. And uh, you need to do that for a number of reasons uh, for certain kinds of statistics, uh, but it's, it's crucial for signal separation. Uh, there's basically, uh, for forecasting next year, for uh, representing the normal as an expected value, um, there are a couple of best simple methods, and we'll talk about them and their merits. And they include just a, a simple-minded 15-year uh, running mean, and they include uh, my invention, the 75 hinge. Um, and I'll say a note about other smoothers. And then I'll talk about Ed Epstein's influence on this particular work, and that influence is considerable. Um, certainly the most important paper was uh, Epstein 1982, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that, and then we'll wrap up. So, let's see. Uh, okay, um, climate change is, is happening, and uh, climate normals are non-stationary. It's a non-stationary statistic. 
Uh, this uh, is, uh, is a, uh, uh, a graph from a paper with Dan Wilkes uh, showing a, uh, the U.S. moon temperature for, a warm, for the warm period of the year. And uh, let's see, how do I, I just move this around, I can point. And you can obviously see the climate change signal in this data. Um, you can, uh, there are actually four different representations of what a possible current normal would be. There's a 30-year mean, that would be this value here. There's a 15-year mean. There's a couple of other curves. Uh, obviously a linear trend fit and uh, and this uh, this shape that actually is an example of 1975 hinge and y you can see that um, um, these uh, well the uh, the trend and the hinge are two possible ways of tracking this non-stationarity and of course um, you know I'm you can't really tell at this point um, whether, uh, and I haven't discussed it, what the merits of them are, but um, there, uh, there is a need to quantify those changes. Um, for U.S. surface temperatures, this non-stationarity, and, and you can certainly see it with this large-scale uh, uh, U.S.-wide average, is notable and widespread in virtually all seasons. 30-year um, normals, like in this particular case, are going to be dominantly cold biased, okay? Okay, so what? Who cares whether they're cold biased? Well, if you're only using a normal as a reference, then the cold bias doesn't matter, and maybe the consistency of using official normals is, is something that appeals to you. But if you want to use the normal as an expected value, in other words, uh, uh, some sense of what the current climate is, then it matters a lot. Here's a, uh, another particular case where, uh, at least for one particular activity, um, you can see how it matters. What you're looking at are heating degree days, a history of heating degree days. So the climate change signal is downward uh, for a station in western Nebraska. Um, again, there's a number of um, um, estimates of climate, of what the climate normal is depicted here. And there are, in fact, three estimates of the current climate. What, where the climate normal, the non-stationary climate normal is in 2010. One is the uh, official normal, the 30-year normal. Another is um, a 10-year normal. And the third is this 1975 hinge. As it turns out in this particular example, the difference between the 30-year normal and uh, these two estimates here is on the order of 250 to 350 heating degree days, okay? Um, that uh, turns out to be equivalent to somewhere between one and a half and two degrees Fahrenheit difference in, in the normal, the daily normal for every day during the, cool, the, the heating season, uh, over the entire extent of the heating season. Um, when you add this up over literally thousands or tens of thousands of units that have to be he heated, this turns out to be a big deal in terms of demand of natural gas over the course of a, a, a winter season for a company. So um, this, this is an example of why this is of considerable interest to um, at least that part of the energy industry. Okay, uh, so estimating the current normal obviously is important, but so is tracking their changes. And uh, one of the reasons that you might want to track how the normal is changing is to separate the climate change signal from climate noise. Here's another example uh, where the 30-year normal and the 1975 hinge are... Uh, 
are fitted to uh, Virginia Division Three data for the winter time, for the January through March period. Now, um, the objective of tracking is that you want to get the best, most relevant estimates of a number of different things. And one of those things is the rate of warming. And uh, obviously, you can't get that out of uh, uh, a 30-year normal. Uh, you can get an estimate from the hinge fit, but there's, there's other approaches to estimating the rate of warming um, that uh, I'm not going to cover today. We're not going to focus on that particular problem that uh, have, you know, the obvious choice is just uh, fitting a, a linear trend to the data that have short, various shortcomings. And there are some advantages to doing it with this approach. Uh, but mainly, I want to talk about the uh, what happens when you're, you want to uh, estimate the level of the climate noise or you want a relevant estimate of some current probability or conditional probability. Um, for example, um, in the case of climate noise, if you just take the sample variance of this data, you're going to overestimate what the climate noise is. What you really have to do is remove the climate change signal to the extent that you can assume that they're independent and use that residual data to estimate the climate noise. But suppose you wanted to estimate what the probability of the wintertime temperature being greater than 44 or less than 36. If you just use this raw data and um, do census um, and to estimate those, those probabilities from uh, frequencies, you're going to inevitably underestimate the, prob the current probability of the winter exceeding 44, and you're going to overestimate the probability of being colder than 36. Okay. I first ran into this problem head on. Wow, we're in good shape. First ran into this problem head on in the spring of 1998. Um, we had just verified our winter forecast for the great El Nino of 97-98. That particular forecast turned out to have a record skill score for temperature. In fact, it was very good for uh, precipitation as well. But it was an all-time record for temperature. Um, nevertheless, I was troubled by it. And the reason I was troubled by it is that um, if, if when you looked at, when you compared the forecast map to the observed map, and I'm not showing it here, this is a different case, uh, the pattern was uh, very well specified in the forecast, and the gradients were, were very good. But there was, it, it was almost like the entire map was systematically cold biased, the, the forecast. And in fact, when you computed quantitatively what the bias was, um, that was the case. And, and that contribution came from virtually everywhere on the map. Uh, I should say a word about, word or two about what the mindset was in the spring of 1998. You know, everybody takes climate, at least in this audience, everybody takes uh, climate change for granted, uh, warming for granted. But to m most of us, uh, dom dominantly, um, climate change was... Uh, we had bought into it. You know, we, we, we liked the science. We, uh, we thought it was good science and uh, that it was um, a legitimate phenomenon, that it was certainly detectable on a global scale. But it was still somewhat of an abstraction uh, in terms of what was happening outside, um, locally, uh, or even at a sub-regional level in the United States. There really wasn't a lot of news or a lot of articles written about 
uh, how much warmer it particularly was at, at this location in that particular season, et cetera. It was still mostly an abstraction for this community. And, um, like I said, we could see it on a global scale, but uh, people weren't talking about it, uh, even this group, at a local scale. Um, thanks to Ed Epstein, I was, I had been thinking about it, and I was sensitive and open to the possibility. And it seemed to me obvious that the reason that that forecast was so cold biased was because we were neglecting the climate change signal. So I decided to try to do something about it, and um, uh, the case I'm showing here uh, shows you exactly uh, what Rich Tinker and I tried to do. Um, this, is, uh, this is for the forecast, the winter forecast for two years later, when we were in the middle of the great La Nina. Um, and the upper two maps are guidance maps presented to the forecasters that were developed before the winter. So it, it didn't include data for the winter of 99-2000. Uh, and the upper one, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go into any details about how they were developed. They were uh, bootstrap techniques, et cetera, composite. Um, an idea of composites combined with bootstrap was used to generate them. This shows the expected temperature signature over the United States for a strong La Nina if a strong La Nina is in place. Uh, but neglecting climate change, um, this particular map takes into account the climate change signal. Uh, we went through a procedure to try to separate the, two, uh, the ENSU signal from the climate change signal, then recombine them to produce this map. And of course, this is a far better representation of what actually happened in 99-2000. And indeed, if we had used the methodology that my gut said I should have used, but I chickened out and used something more conservative, it would have been much more like this map. Um, all, of this, uh, all of this was based on, uh, the reason we did this was based on uh, things that uh, Ed had sensitized to me a number of years earlier. Uh, some work I had done with Tom Smith, and it w uh, it turned out uh, the method we used was a 1966 hinge. So, um, if if you're faced with any of these problems, you want to develop composites, histograms, estimates of probabilities, probability distributions, or probabilities, whether con conditional or, or otherwise, relevant to the current climate then you've got you've to make some kind of shot at separating the climate change signal from whatever, uh, wet, well, from the climate noise. And the way you go about this is to first try to track the non-stationary normal as completely, well, you have to, have to track it completely, and you should do it as simply and smoothly as reasonable. There are three different approaches to doing that for this particular data. This is wintertime data in a particular climate division, a mega climate division. And the hinge, uh, the hinge fit is shown. The hinge fit has a zero slope to a hinge point at 1975 and linear warming thereafter. And two other methods that um, are analogous, one is a moving average, and the other is analogous to a moving average, a running mean. Um, and the reason I put all three of these up is because th the two moving average-based approaches to um, smoothing and tracking the normal, um, well, first of all, they're not complete. They've got, uh, there are compromises that you have to make at the, at the beginning and end of the series, okay? But more importantly, they're not smooth, and they're obviously still retaining a, a, a good amount of climate noise. There hasn't been a clear separation here between the climate signal, the, the global change signal, and the climate noise. 
So uh, once, you, once you've uh, fitted, uh, you've tracked the non-stationary normal in a reasonably smooth way, if you can assume to first order that the climate noise is independent of the climate change, and in this data and most uh, temperature data that you're going to look at, at, at least in this part of the world, you'd be hard pressed to demonstrate otherwise. Uh, doesn't mean it's not going to be the case in the future, but uh, for now, um, uh, the data does not reflect any dependence that, that you can see of the noise, the variability versus the global change signal. So uh, if you can assume that, then you can compute the residuals, uh, just subtract the data from the, from the hinge fit, and then recenter all those residuals to the current, to the last value on the hinge curve, basically the estimate of the current normal. And then you're in, um, then you can happily proceed to uh, composite on, say, uh, strong ENSO, strong El Ninos or La Ninas. Uh, you can compute uh, conditional probabilities or just raw probabilities. And they should be much more relevant estimates of uh, what, uh, what's going on right now. Um, if, um, if you don't do this, um, you will be compromising your analysis because inevitably your statistics, whatever, whatever you did up here, are going to be cold biased, almost certainly cold biased. Okay, so um, let me summarize um, um, what um, a couple of good, good simple methods for solving the first problem, just estimating the current climate um, are, and also um, would be useful for making a nine-month lead seasonal forecast. And uh, the brief conclusions I'm going to show here are based on uh, a paper by Dan Wilkes uh, last year, and then a follow-up paper where I partnered with Dan to extend that work to other data sets and situations. Um, the best simple approach to estimating the current climate when you look at uh, the body of different surface data sets, whether they're the climate division data, uh, station data, whether, it, whether it's in good shape or whether you're uh, using the fully homogenized data, uh, over all seasons and over all parts of the country, the best thing you can do is just do a 15-year running mean. It's the most forgiving. Uh, obviously, uh, for depending upon the data set or uh, what your problem is, either the season particular season or a particular part of the country, it may be different. But this is um, a reasonably safe, um, fail-safe pick. It, it provides, and I'm not going to go into the details of the theory, the best overall tra trade-off between bias error, it's a, mainly a consequence of, of the warming, and sampling error, okay? Um, the Next best choice when, uh, well, it's actually the best choice when uh, the, warming, the warming rate in the particular season part of the country is, is strong. And for better, better surface station data, in other words, uh, station data that uh, either in, in its uh, um, official form, unprocessed form, is pretty clean, or the fully homogenized NCDC data, uh, the best choice is the 1975 hinge. Now, when that was introduced, um, well, when I first introduced it to CPC staff in 1998, and then subsequent to the paper, there was a lot of criticism, uh, a, lot of, a lot of skepticism about the arbitrariness of um, what, a, what, what the hinge is, is a very, um, extremely simple statistical model of climate change. And it assumes, it, it, it fixes the rate of change as 
zero between 1940 and 1975 with a hinge point at 1975. And um, even though that was based on a lot of studies and a lot of experience, um, a lot, it was criticized, uh, the choices were criticized as being somewhat arbitrary, and I guess they are. But it turns out that um, both of these studies, Dan Wilkes studies and Wilkes and Libsy, um, both, um, both, validated, um, uh, both validated those choices. So um, uh, that particular um, uh, issue, I think, is mostly put to rest. Um, now, why did I put this up again? Um, oh, I, it's just uh, just to remind you uh, the two two um, best competitors, at least from using simple-minded approaches, is the 1975 hinge and the 15-year normal. Here's another example that I used recently in a natural gas rate case, Minneapolis St. Paul Airport in the winter. Um, since I've got only four and a half minutes, I'm going to skip this slide. It, uh, it makes one major point that, okay, uh, I won't, okay. Um, just let's stop and for a moment think about what, what the desirable attributes of these different methods should be. And remember, you have two objectives. One is, uh, a, uh, the best estimate of the current climate, another is to track the uh, climate to the current, uh, to that current best estimate. Well, uh, it's desirable to have small squared error in estimating next year, uh, likewise small bias error in estimating next year. Uh, it should be reasonably stable. If you recompute it one year from now, you don't want it to be drastically different. And you ought to be able to, uh, if you need to track the climate, do it smoothly and reasonably through the entire record. Well, uh, the 15-year the average or any version of the optimum climate normal uh, is, is uh, it will give you uh, a uh, excellent uh, small squared error and small bias, but it won't be stable. And of course, I've already shown you that you can't use it to track the, track the normal smoothly and completely. Um, you can do all of those things with the hinge, and it, it's extremely stable, and probably and certainly has less bias overall than the 15-year uh, normal. Now, there are other time series smoothers that will do just as good of a job but they're more complicated and they're a little bit more arbitrary. There's one particular um, paper recently by Krakauer that has uh, a very nice representation of the non-stationary normal in extreme temperatures, U.S. extreme temperatures, all the way from um, uh, early in the century to the present. And in fact, uh, if you look at the post-1940 part of it, uh, it's pretty much just a slightly smoothed out hinge. It's almost exactly what you would get from the hinge fit. But you would need to use that approach, for example, if you wanted to go uh, fit pre-1940, if, if, your, if your needs required that. Uh, now, how did Ed Epstein influence this work? Um, I think the most important influence came from his 1982 paper, Detecting Climate Change. I thought this was a beautiful, beautiful, simple little paper. Basically, what Ed did was propose three different um, uh, models of what was going, uh, of climate change that he used to fit data up to 1981 or 1982. He then used uh, statistical theory, um, a, a very nice analysis. Then, that given each of these hypotheses, how long, how, how confident could we, would we be in, or how confidently could we detect that climate change five years from 
1982, 10 years from 1982, 15 years from 1982, because there was a lot of debate about whether or not the signal was detectable yet. And in fact, it was really, as we know now, it was really just getting started. Well, Ed concluded from this analysis that within 10 years, under uh, any of these scenarios, we would uh, be able to very confidently detect climate change, at least on a global scale. This made a big impression on me. Um, and I remember, and I'm, uh, if you look at the three different hypotheses, one of them looks very much like the hinge. You could almost call it a 1973 hinge. And it was really here that I first had the notion that that would be an appropriate representation of post-1940 climate change. It was at Epstein. And um, it was also this paper that made me confident when I was thinking about how to proceed in the spring of 1998 that in fact climate change was not an abstraction over the U.S but was already an important factor. Um, Tom Carl asked Ed and I to participate in another paper to help him determine how unusual, given the hypothesis that there was no climate change, that there was just natural variability, uh, how unusual the events of the mid-70s and the early 80s were, the winter times. And uh, we, we um, did that work together and concluded that uh, there would be a thousand year return period. Uh, the contribution of this paper, that is, it just reinforced uh, my sensitivity to what was happening in the mid 70s to the late 80s and uh, that indeed that might have been the onset of modern climate change. And then lastly, the four, uh, four published climatology papers that Dave Unger showed in his list that um, emphasized that the need, at least in the prediction problem, but far beyond that, to smoothly and well represent what the climate normals are. So um, that wraps it up. Um, and I think I've gone a little bit over, and I apologize for that. Um, just a, a few words of conclusion. Warming is ubiquitous, and current normals are, you, you really have to estimate it with some alternative to a 30-year average. Uh, there are some exceptions where there will be extreme departures from the warming, but we're not going to know what those exceptions are in advance. So in order to uh, approach this problem resiliently, if, if it's if you have the need to it, you can fall back on using a 15-year running mean or in some instances use the 1975 hinge. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. We just heard a couple of the experts on climate and climate change and so forth. Do you have any questions for Robert? Um, just continued reevaluation of its performance. It's going to change very, very little each year because you're essentially fitting uh, how many 70, 70 plus years of data. So it's only going to have a subtle change in what the pre-1975 level is and the slope. And so, uh, no, I it it. It isn't going to be a good answer forever, but it's a good answer right now. If, if you have to, if you have a need to do signal separation, and if you have a situation with good station data, and or any data with a strong warming signal, it's it's a pretty good way to estimate the current normal.
parts of the country, the warming signal isn't very strong. In the southeast, you have the warming hole. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, than not, you're just less skillful down that area? Well, uh, yeah, the, 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 the 15 year or maybe even a a longer, maybe a 20 year OSIN might be a better representation. Um, you know, Dan, Dan in his original paper uh, concluded that for when, when you, and he was looking at um, climate division data, uh, he concluded that overall the 15 year running mean was actually the safest approach, it was the most resilient. So if, if you have a specific area and a specific season that you're interested in, a better answer might be a shorter running mean. 